life was quite different in the South. There, agriculture was the major source of jobs and wealth. Long growing seasons and rich soil produced rice, tobacco, and cotton, cash crops grown for sale in distant markets. The vast majority of Southern whites were poor farmers who eked out a living as best they could. But big plantation owners with many slaves dominated the South, economically, socially, and politically. The North had outlawed slavery in the decades following the American Revolution. Back then, many Americans believed that slavery would die out on its own because it was no longer profitable. But then something happened. Raw cotton had always been very expensive because it took too long to separate the sticky seeds from the fiber. Then, in 1793, Eli Whitney, a young teacher from New England, invented the cotton gin. With this simple machine, a slave could clean more than 50 pounds of cotton a day. The cotton gin transformed cotton from a luxury item into the world's cheapest fabric. Booming textile factories in the northern states and England paid good money for all they could get. And the South was the world's major supplier. There was a bigger demand for cotton, and in order to get that cotton, the South needed a lot of land. To work the land, they needed a large labor force, and the largest, cheapest labor force available was the enslaved African. Doubling in value every 10 years, cotton production soon dominated the southern economy. The cotton belt spread west across the south. Close to a million slaves were marched in chains to the southern frontier, where they cleared land and grew cotton to make their masters rich. So by the end of the second decade of the 19th century, the states in the South, the Deep South, were really committed to slavery because it gave them an economic advantage. The louder she screamed, the harder he whipped. And where the blood ran the fastest, there he whipped the longest. Southern wealth rested on the backs of slaves. Even though some slave owners treated their slaves well, Southern slavery was brutal, degrading, and deadly. Dressed only in coarse linen clothing, children received only two shirts a year. When these failed them, they went naked, winter or summer. It was not uncommon for slaves to work from dawn to dusk, then do their own washing, mending, and cooking before falling to sleep. They slept on cold, damp, bare floors, often with only a coarse blanket, even in the cold of winter. Slaves considered a good master, one who gave them enough to fill their stomachs. Many had barely enough to eat. Believing that slaves couldn't be governed except with the whip, masters and overseers beat men and women, young and old, even pregnant women, for any reason or for none. Born a slave in Maryland, Frederick Douglass revealed the hardships and horrors of slavery in his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. According to Douglass, to be accused was to be convicted, and to be convicted was to be punished. Frederick Douglass in his autobiography talks about seeing a young mother beaten while her children watched, unable to do anything to stop them. And this is something that's hard for us to understand, but we just need to remember that the enslaved people were not considered people. They were considered property. Slavery, Douglas observed, was dehumanizing, not only to the slave, but to the slaveholder as well. He would watch it turn his own mistress's tender heart to a stone. Before she learned how to be a proper slave master, his mistress did, however, give Douglas a gift that transformed his life. She taught him to read. When she started to teach her son to read, she also taught Frederick. And she called her husband in to show him how quickly he had learned to read. And as soon as her husband saw Frederick with a book, he snatched it away and told her, you must never teach a slave to read or to write. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master. If you teach that nigger how to read, there would be no keeping him. These words burned in Douglas. He read and learned whenever he could. As it turned out, there was no keeping him. 
Douglas escaped in 1838 and soon thereafter became one of America's most powerful voices against slavery. Not every black man and woman in the South was a slave. In the 1800s, during the period that slavery was still very much alive in this country, there were tens of thousands, actually, of African people, people of African descent, who were freed one way or another. They had run away, they had managed to get free after their slave owners died, uh, their relatives bought them out, and sometimes out of conscience, people would release their slaves. Some of them travel north, particularly places like Philadelphia, and increase the black population. And it was through free black community building that the modern black community emerged, so with churches, with organizations, with a sense of self. And even as they tried to become Americans, they also wanted to hold on to this separate identity. So it was a free black population that was increasingly conscious of its place in America and its need to define its place in America. They held a variety of uh, occupations. They were draymen, they were bricklayers, they were carpenters, and in fact, in, in Charleston, most of the building trades were dominated by free blacks. But such cases were rare indeed. The vast majority of African Americans lived and died as slaves.